الحمدللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام علی رسول الكریم وعلی آلہ وصحبہ اجمائین السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ جزاک ملہ خیر and thank you all for being here my name is Zabun Awar Beg I am one of the board of directors of SEED on behalf of entire SEED organization I would like to welcome you all to the SEED annual fundraising dinner much of it's nice to see you all I really appreciate you all coming here taking time from your busy schedule on Saturday night. So we have a busy agenda today. So inshallah, let's get started with the program. So we'll start the program with the recitation of Holy Quran by Hafiz Adil Ibrahim. Inshallah, he will read Surah al -Badar. And then followed by uh, Amin Ahak will read the translation of the Surah al -Badar. Inshallah. Adil. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد ووالد وما ولد لقد خلقنا الإنسان في كبد أيحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلكت مالا لبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلقد حمى العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة فك رقبة أو إطعام في يوم ذي مزغبة يتيما ذا مقربة أو مسكينا ذا متربة ثم كان من الذين آمنوا وتواصوا بالصبر وتواصوا بالمرحمة أولئك أصحاب الميمنة والذين كفروا بآياتنا هم أصحاب المشأمة عليهم نار مؤصدة صدق الله العظيم In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I do call to witness this city, and thou art a free man of this city, and the mystic ties of parent and child. Verily, we have created man into toil and struggle. Thinketh he that none hath power over him? He may say boastfully, Wealth have I squandered in abundance. Thinketh he that none beholdeth him? Have we not made for him a pair of eyes, and a tongue, and a pair of lips, and shown him the two highways? But he hath made no haste on the path that is steep. And what will explain to thee the path that is steep? It is freeing the bondman, or the giving of food in a day of privation, to the orphan with claims of relationship, or to the indigent down in the dust. Then will he be of those who believe and enjoy patience, constancy, and self-restraint, and enjoy deeds of kindness and compassion. Such are the companions of the right hand. But those who reject our signs, they are the unhappy companions of the left hand. On them, on them will be fire vaulted over all round. Jadamallah Khair, Adil and Amina. MashaAllah, very nice recitation and translation. Adil has uh, graduated from IJD his program and Amina is uh, doing her hips in IJD his program. MashaAllah. 
I think most of you already know uh, what SEED is all about, uh, what are the SEED activities. I see some new faces in the audience, so I just want to give you a brief introduction of SEED. I'll say just a few minutes, inshallah. Uh, SEED is a, a stand for support for educational and economic development. As the name says, uh, we educate uh, orphans, poor children, train Muslim youth for jobs, and then we provide financial support to the widows and destitute families, and we provide medical care to the needy. Uh, SEED is a 501c3 non profit organization. It started in 2009. It's been uh, in operation for eight years. It was founded by uh, Sayyid uh, Mother Husseini, who is sitting here. He came all the way from Dallas, Texas to participate in the fundraiser. So the vision of CED is to reduce the conditions of poverty and improve the quality of life for the poor. And our mission is to implement educational and technical training and medical care programs for the poor so they can lead a respectful life. Our objectives like to conduct charitable activities in the slum areas of India, work to reduce poverty, improve quality of life and promote economic development. We also like to provide opportunities for the underprivileged children and adults in the economically backward areas of India. We operate in see with certain with the highest levels of values that includes taqwa, honesty, integrity, transparency, and accountability. This is we are doing basically a service to the humanity. We believe in charity with dignity, we respect all the recipients of our donations. And we follow the law of the land both here in US and in India. Because of SEED's commitment to accountability, transparency, and ethical practices, we got the accreditation by Better Bureau of Business and GuideStar, which are the two evaluators of the charity organizations in US. Getting accreditation from Better Bureau of Business is not very easy. They have very stringent requirements with respect to the checks and balances, transparency, and Alhamdulillah, we have met all the requirements. So we got the accreditation with the Better Bureau Business. So we can all donate with confidence and trust. So we have four major programs in SEED. Education for orphans, poor children and adults, vocational training for jobs, medical help to the needy and financial support to the widows and destitute families. So within these four major programs, we have sub-programs which are going to talk about that in my second presentation. So we have seen chapters in four states today, in Texas, in Illinois, Michigan and Oklahoma. This year we introduced seed uh, in California, Maryland and New Jersey and Arizona. Inshallah, we are planning to open new chapters in these four states this year. And we need some volunteers. If you know anyone in those four states, please let us know. We want to work with them. So some of you might be wondering, since SEED being a US-based organization, how it works in India. So since SEED is a US-based organization, we cannot directly distribute funds in India on our own. Because Indian government doesn't allow foreign entities to come in India and do the charity work. So we select and pick some local non-government organizations who have the government permit to receive 
foreign funds. So we carefully select those local organizations and we do partnership with them. There is an act called uh, FCRA. So they need to have this FCRA government permit to receive funds from foreign charity organizations. So we also have those NGOs to make a pledge and sign a memorandum of understanding so that they follow all the rules that we set for them. So we thoroughly review their financial status, their operations, so that to make sure they are genuine and, and legal organization in India. So we transfer funds through reputable banks from here to their NGOs account. So through NGOs we provide this financial support to these schools, orphanages, training centers, medical clinics that NGOs run in India. So we also monitor their activities. We get monthly reports from these NGOs. We also go there few times in India and we see their activities first hand. Our uh, executive director, Brother Mazhar Mazhar Hussaini, goes there every every year, twice a year. He spends about two months there traveling all over India. He meets with all the NGOs. He meets with all the recipients of our donations, the donors. He visits the medical clinics, the training centers, and talks to the trainees. And he gets the uh, frequent updates from them. We also get the progress of the students, trainees, very frequently. So we, even though we are based in US, we still monitor the activities through online or by being there. So basically, we may also wonder, there are so many organizations working in India doing these similar charities, so why we need to pick C or why we need to go to next C. So C is a voluntary organization, we don't have any full-time paid employees. All the BODs are volunteer basis, they work. We have, we try to keep the expenses as minimum as possible, so you guys are the, the poor people can get the most benefits out of your donations. So like every charity to operate, they have operational expenses. So do we. But the special thing with CD is, we don't take a dollar from donations to cover our operational expenses. All the BODs cover the operational expenses from their own pocket. So 100% of your donations go to the seed activities, childhood activities in India. Also, 99% of our recipients of your donations are zakat eligible. So how can we help? There are simple, there are many ways we can help. We can support a widow or a destitute family with six hundred dollars per year. And you can also support an orphan's education. You can support one vocational training candidate. You can support a poor children's education. Or you can support one poor patient's medical care. So these are different ways you can donate. We have some uh, self-mailers on the table. You can also take a look at that. So you can do one time yearly or online, or you can also mail those self-mailers. So this is what I would like to introduce Seed to you all. Inshallah, I will give you some of the uh, programs we have in, the, in my next presentation. At this time, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker. We are honored to have uh, Sheikh Mohammed Al Masmari here. Jazakallah for coming here. Uh, Sheikh Al Masmari doesn't need any introduction. Uh, most of us already know him. He is the Imam of Muslim Unity Center. He is a renowned scholar and a well known uh, speaker. He is also executive director of MMCC.
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering, to shower upon us with His mercy, to reward you all for coming out on a Saturday evening. Alhamdulillah, this is a good sign that among our ummah, our people continue to plant the seed of good. This is a blessing. Beloved brothers and respected sisters, when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the responsibility to deliver this message, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam focused on three groups with many others. But his primary focus was on three groups or three things. Three things that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to accomplish in order for the community to succeed, in order for things to move forward, in order to achieve that success and victory that many of us hope for, inshallah, for this ummah. Number one, brothers and sisters, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to focus on oneself on building a good, solid human being. A person that is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is respected and respectful to others. A person of good character. And when focusing on this human being, He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was focusing on different elements. Number one, their spiritual level. It is very difficult to have a successful ummah if our connection with Allah is disconnected. When the Prophet ﷺ was given the obligation and the order, the command to deliver this da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Qum al-layla illa qalila, get up and establish your prayer. So he was given this da'wah, he was given revelation, and in order for you to succeed, O oh Muhammad, you have to begin prostrating. You have to begin to involve yourself in heavy salah, heavy ibadat. And that's where everything begins. We tell people that it begins from that prayer rug. Your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what motivates you, what allows you to give, what allows you to donate, what allows you to improve who you are and what you stand for. It allows you to navigate through the challenges of life. So he focused on their spirituality. He focused on their intellectual level, which was ilm. Making sure that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was dealing with an educated community. Seeking knowledge is a blessing. And in many ahadith, as many of you know, where he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would encourage people to reach out and seek ilm, different majors, not only Islamic, in the Islamic field, empowering everyone in his community regardless of their background, their educational background. Everyone has something to contribute to this ummah. If we only had Imams in this ummah, we won't succeed. And if we had any group of people where you can say the ummah was part of that professional group, we won't succeed. But the diversity that we find among the ummah where you have this person that is good at that, professional field and this person in that field and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us together as one ummah, a unified ummah. So people want spirituality, also brothers and sisters, one's intellectual level, number three, one's body, taking care of yourself and that's why in Islam we encourage to take care of ourselves, to be well dressed, well maintained, to take showers and number four, one's emotions. That's how he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to build the Sahaba. A very, very strong generation. That was the first point. And I believe that's a few lectures by itself, but I have 20 minutes and I'm trying to get to the topic of the night. So number one, oneself. Number two, what determined the Prophet's success is that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam right away understood the importance of building an institution. That we cannot succeed as an ummah if we don't have 
institutions within our communities that stand firm and tall, where people come and perform their ibadah, come and educate themselves, and that's the role of the masjid. The role of the masjid is something that he وسلم, began early on, right when he migrated to Medina. As all of you know, he built the masjid. There has to be a masjid in every community. It is very difficult for us, the community, to succeed and to overcome the communal challenges and obstacles without having a solid location that embraces everyone, that welcomes everyone, that addresses people's issues, their daily issues, their conflict, their family matters, their issues with their children, struggles that our children are facing in school. And that's where the masjid comes in. With all the talent that we have and all the resources that we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with locations like this. That's why walking into a masjid and participating in a gathering like this, a person is forgiven. Why? Because this is where change takes place in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, which I would like to focus on, is what made the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam achieve that success with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance, of course. And I feel that our communities need to focus on this one. Wallahi, when I drove in and I entered Tawheed, I was like, beautiful masjid. It's amazing when you see a clean masjid. It feels so good. So I don't feel that we're struggling with that. As institutions, all of our masajid have to improve in a way. We have a lot to do, alhamdulillah. But I feel that we're getting there, we're blessed. But the last point, I feel that we're struggling with as a community. The Prophet wasallam, brothers and sisters, focus on the weak. We only focus on leaders and those who are well established. We only focus on people who look like us, talk like us, have the same education as us share the same concerns, and that's it. The Prophet ﷺ focused on the weak. And if our ummah does not realize that we cannot succeed without our weak, the weakest among us is what allows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support, what allows that giving, what allows that rahmah to descend, what allows the barakah, the blessing to come down. It is the weak. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِلَّا بِضُعَفَائِكُمْ Isn't it the weak among you who bring victory along as you perceive? SubhanAllah, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu He heard one of the Sahaba and the Sahabi said, he narrated the hadith and this is in Muslim, Sahih Muslim. He said, لَا تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ إِلَّا وَقُومُ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ that the day of judgment will not come until the majority of the world are Romans. The ulama debated, was he وسلم, addressing an ethnicity, the Caucasians, or was he وسلم, speaking about a religion, the Christians? And this is a debate among our ulama. Amr ibn al-As, when he heard that, he asked that sahabi, he said, can you repeat that hadith again? Again, look at how Amr al As connected. What? SubhanAllah, even though what Amr, inshaAllah, as you see in the hadith, what Amr is going to say has nothing to do with the hadith. But he asked the Sahabi, can you repeat what you said about the Romans and them being the majority in the world? He says it. He said, can you say, Wallah, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this hadith? Can you swear in the name of Allah that He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it? He said, yeah, yeah, the Prophet said it. Yeah, well, it's not complicated, it's a clear hadith. He says, since the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, these individuals and this community has five qualities. And that's what led to their success. So they became the majority in the world, brothers and sisters, not because of anything, not because of their ethnicity, but because of their service, because of certain points, because of the points that I'm going to mention. 
He says they have five amazing points and that's what led to their success. And I truly feel that this is what sets the foundational, you know, the foundation of success within our communities. He mentions a few. Number one, he said these are individuals that are very calm and balanced in troubling times. That's why they were successful. Now if we have an issue in the masjid, everyone gets up and yells. I think everyone has experienced that. Everyone is yelling. He said what made that community a successful community? That they are the most calm in the most troubling times. They think through before anything is said. They think a few times, not once. A few times before saying anything. And that's why you find them when they talk, they talk with respect. Even though they may say something that's very difficult to accept. He said number two, that they are the quickest to respond after defeat. And again, each point needs a lot of explanation. He says number three, that they are the quickest to stand back up after them being knocked down. That you can knock them down, you can punch them down, you can do whatever you want to do. They declare their uh, their defeat, that they were weakened by the army or whatever it was, but they're the quickest to get back up right away. And they run towards their goal. Number four, he says, That they are the most merciful towards their weak. That's what led to their success. Is that they're very gentle and merciful towards the weak. SubhanAllah, our communities are trying to succeed. Those are the individuals whom we need to work on. The people that need you most. For an example, here in Michigan, we have a large African-American population. When you go to them and you speak about Islam, they relate to you right away. Many of them declare their shahada right away. They relate to your struggle. They understand your mission. They know and understand your role within society. And they're prepared to accept. But what do Muslims do? We go and look for the politicians. We want a few pictures. We're so excited, we come with our suits, and we want things to change. And that's not how we build bridges, even though that part is very important. But we cannot neglect the majority of people that need your message, and need what you have to offer. When the Prophet wasallam, brothers and sisters, listen to this hadith. The ulama, may Allah shower them, with his mercy. So if he وسلم, had an option to hide a chapter in Quran, he وسلم, would have hidden Surah Abbas. If he was given the authority to hide chapters, like he won't deliver and convey the message, he would have kept Surah Abbas to himself. Because Allah criticized the Prophet وسلم, Surah Abbas. He was criticized in Surah Abbas that even though he didn't do anything. Very simple. Ibn Ubi Maktoum was a blind man that came to the Prophet as the Prophet وسلم, was given the greatest opportunity of his life to convey his message to the leaders of Quraysh, the politicians, the leaders, the noble ones. And as he was speaking to them and delivering his da'wah and addressing their concerns, he was amazed that they gave him that opportunity. They all listened. They were all there. And Ibn Ummi Maktoum comes out of nowhere. He was blind. Ibn Ummi Maktoum couldn't see. He's the second caller of Adhan with Bilal radiallahu anhu arda. He would call Adhan and Bilal also would call Adhan. Ibn Ummi Maktoum would call the first Adhan of Fajr and Bilal radiallahu anhu would call the next Adhan. Two Adhans of Fajr. And he comes to the Prophet and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, can you teach me Islam? So now you have a Muslim that's coming to the Prophet when he's giving da'wah 
And he's not asking a question about Islam. He wants the Prophet to teach him everything about Islam. And imagine you're talking in front of the leaders of your community and someone keeps on cutting you off as you deliver your lecture or giving your talk. And he insists and he says, Ya Rasulullah, alimni al-Islam. Ya Rasulullah, alimni al-Islam. And the Prophet just looked at him. Just looked. Was Ibn Ubi Maktoum harmed by that look or offended? No. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ did not disrespect him. Number two, Ibn Ummi Maktoum was blind to begin with. So he didn't know what happened. But the moment the Prophet looked at Ibn Ummi Maktoum, in that way, Allah revealed the complete chapter in the Quran. That how come you didn't focus on Ibn Ummi Maktoum? Those individuals were not seeking guidance, it was him. You were focusing on individuals that potentially can change, but you have another person that is willing to change already. Why are you focusing on the elite and the rich and the wealthy and the noble and the known? When you have someone next to you that's weak, but is prepared to accept your da'wah. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then was taught a great lesson to focus on these individuals. When Abu Sufyan comes to a gathering and Bilal was sitting down with Salman al-Farisi, Abu Sufyan comes in, Abu Bakr tells Salman and Bilal, Quma li Sayyidi Makkah, that get up for the leader of Makkah. It hurt Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal is the leader of Mu'addineen on the day of Tujah. Bilal is the first Sahabi to get on the Kaaba and to call the Adha. Bilal is the one whom the Prophet said, I heard your footsteps in Jannah. And Abu Bakr is telling him, stand up for the leader of Quraysh. It hit him. And he didn't complain about it. And the news reaches the Prophet And Abu Bakr was confident. It was okay. It was okay. Didn't say anything wrong because Abu Sufyan was a leader. To honor people is something normal. The Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Abu Bakr, La in ma faqad aghdabta rabbak. That if you have angered Bilal and Salman, radiallahu anhuma, then you have angered your Lord. Abu Sufyan then rushes to Abu Dhar and sits in his presence and seeks his forgiveness. Prophet ﷺ focused on the weak. In another incident, Abu Sufyan and the leaders of Quraysh come and they find the Prophet sitting next to the Kaaba. And they walk towards the Prophet. And they said, Ya Muhammad, we're willing to listen. But we have one condition. One condition. Imagine, someone is coming to you and wants to listen to your da'wah. And the Prophet knew the influence he had and how good of a speaker he was. He knew that they would be affected by the Quran. Can you just imagine how excited he was? How excited he was that he was given this opportunity by the leaders of Quraysh. That they are willing to listen under one condition. He said, what's your condition? He said, Bilal and Salman, these individuals, we don't want them here. If you can take them out, we'll listen. Right away, Allah reveals an ayah in Surah Al-Kahf. وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيمِ بِيْتُونَ وَجْمِ Be patient with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and the evening. Be patient with Bilal and Salman. Don't look towards those people. Even though he was asked to give da'wah, don't focus on them. That's where you begin. And I've said this more than once. Every time I go to Medina, and alhamdulillah, I go twice a year. When I find people fighting over a rawla, there's one location that I go and visit every time I go to Medina. And to me, I feel more of a spiritual connection sitting there than getting into a rawla, with getting my head knocked out, with getting stepped on my head, with people pushing me, is the location of Sufa, where the people would come and sit next to the Prophet's door waiting for the prophetic presence to shine, waiting for the Prophet to walk out where he provides for them and provides food and shelters those weak Sahaba. 
And you see it next to his rooms. That's where all the weak Sahaba, the sick, the elderly, would sit next to the Prophet وسلم, as he would walk out. And he would serve them. Who wouldn't want to visit that location? To remember the Prophet <laughs> When you come to, even now, how do people look at orphans? Even in our communities, sometimes they may be looked down upon. And the Prophet comes to a community and says, if you wipe your hand over his hair, for every hair you get a hasan. And every hasana is multiplied by ten. Imagine how would that orphan feel when a leader would come and wipe his head and provide him with food. When the Prophet says in a hadith, that me and those who support orphans are like this in Jannah. And he began the hadith by spreading his fingers widely as much as he can. And then when he said the Jannah part, he said like this. Imagine how good the orphan felt. Knowing that his supporter will enter Jannah, let alone the orphan himself. The supporter of the orphan would stand next to the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah and he would walk with the Prophet and the Sahaba. There are people among our Ummah, brothers and sisters, who will enter Jannah with the Prophet and the Sahaba knowing that they were not Sahaba nor they were Prophets. They were righteous people. Few among them were Sahaba and others were those who embodied good character whom the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in his prophetic tradition that they would stand by his side. Umm Imara, a female Sahabiyyah, would walk with the Prophet into Jannah together with the Sahaba and the Prophets. Umm Imara And one of them are those who sponsor orphans. Brothers and sisters, it's Maghrib time now. I do feel that everyone is blessed to participate in a gathering like this, where the amal, where the work and the effort is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. For me personally, I don't feel comfortable to speak in organizations or raise funds or that's not what I do where I go. And, but when there is an honorable cause, I feel that people must participate as much as they can. If someone could benefit from your sadaqah, and hopefully take himself to the next level. Allah and you get the answer. Allahu Akbar. Jazakum Allahu Khairah. Allah.